You're listening to the Cat Breeder Sensei Says Podcast, the show that supports the reputable breeding of pedigree cats. This is your show host, April Catito, and in this episode, we're going to do a mashup. That's where we take several interesting topics and put them all into one quick and easy to listen to episode. Before we get started with that though, I wanna tell you about the course that I've created for people like you. If you're just starting out as a pedigree cat breeder or maybe you've been at it for a little while, but know that you need to dive a little deeper into some more advanced topics like caring for kittens or genetics, then this is perfect for you. The Complete Guide to Breeding Pedigree Cats is an online training portal where you have access to all of the topics that you need to get off or to continue on the right foot. So when I'm talking to breeders and my peers, I realize that there's a lot of information that the breeders don't know. They don't know how genetics works. They're not familiar with the DNA testing or how to care for neonatal kittens, how to actually get their cats to mate. I mean, importing kittens from another country, what their contracts should say when they're working with their buyers. There's just so many topics that should be covered for new pedigree cat breeders and there's really has not been a place for anybody to get that information until right now. So that's why I created the complete guide to breeding pedigree cats. You can access the course, start your training immediately. There's over a dozen different lessons which include subtopics so it takes about three to four weeks to actually get through all of the material you go at your own pace and you actually consume the information and there's assignments that you turn in it's interactive you give feedback from a coach slash mentor and you actually take quizzes at the end of each topic to make sure that you understand the information before you move on. So it's a really an awesome course. The feedback on it is great. So go have a peek at it. And if you're not interested, then definitely share it with those people that contact you and ask you where to get information because I know that I get questions all the time from random people who are interested in getting started as a pedigree cat breeder and they're asking for help and they just get a lot of no and a, a lot of resistance and it's kind of a way to you know offer them the help and the guidance that they need because one thing is for sure even though people are getting no's that's not going to stop them what it's going to do is probably just encourage them even more to just you know prove a point that they can do it and they don't need help i mean that's what i kind of see out there and unfortunately that's you know what people are met with is this resistance as new pedigree cat breeders and that's really the wrong way to go about things if you want to protect your breed and there's people coming in that want to be a part of that then help them either by being their mentor or pointing them in the right direction where they can at least get some basic general knowledge of feline husbandry how to care for their cats and how to be a reputable cat breeder. I mean, that's really what you want to happen, right? So, complete guide to breeding pedigree cats. Um, You can use the code PODCAST21 and get $25 off the enrollment fee, and it's really an awesome course, so check it out. Okay, so our mashup topics this week are pretty interesting. Um, Let's first talk about the temperature in the cattery. So, This probably applies, you know, whether you have a cattery in your home or a special room or even an external cattery where your cats have their own apartment or townhouse. So the rule of thumb is that the cattery should not be 
any colder than 55 degrees and it should not be any warmer than 85 degrees and I know that where I'm at it it can go you know below 55 and above 85 for sure so if you're going to have your cats in their own location make sure that you have a temperature controlled environment where you can adjust those temperatures accordingly and make sure that your cats are comfortable and not getting too hot or too cold now some people will probably think that 55 is too cold and that 85 is too warm and that you know is definitely your discretion uh, but those are the guidelines as set by some of the associations so how long should you leave your queen with your sire when they're mating and this is a great question because a lot of newbies just don't they don't know what it takes or how long it takes well the fact is is that a queen can get pregnant just with one mating but that doesn't mean that she will so there's a couple of different ways that uh, breeders do this and you can do you know you start getting into the groove of things and you do what works for you so some breeders will monitor the matings and make sure that they've mated at least four or five times. So they have actually seen it happen. They see the queen doing the fish flop and rolling around and you know that they have successfully mated. So once you've seen that four or five times, then it's probably safe to say they had successful mating session. Some may choose to leave their cats together for 24 hours. So a full 24 hours um, should be enough for a mating session. Now, this is considering when you put your queen in with the male. So if you're putting her in on the right day, then 24 hours should be enough. They say, the pros um, say that you should put your queen in with your male on day two of her estrus cycle. So the first day that you notice that she is in obvious heat, wait until the next day and then put her in with the male. And then there's some breeders that will allow the queen and the sire to be together for three or four days and that's full days. So it's up to you how you decide to run your cattery and what works for you and what works for your cat. So what works for some pairs may not work for others. So you just have to observe their behavior and and see you know what you think until you develop your own system for doing things. Hairballs. So short-haired cats and long-haired cats can both get hairballs. And sometimes there's nothing you can do to prevent those. You should, if they're prone to getting hairballs, which some cats are more prone than others to getting hairballs, then make sure that you're grooming them as much as you can daily, if possible, just brush them so that you're getting that extra hair and fur out of their, um, out of their coat, not actually consuming that. There's also a product called Alaxitone that you can give your cats if you think that they have a hairball and some of the signs you know you don't sometimes you don't know that the hairball is coming but sometimes they'll get upset tummies and you may see them vomit and you may even notice diarrhea you know you know nothing has changed no food changes and they're feeling fine but then hairball sometimes can make their stomach upset so if you notice that, there's a product called Laxatone that you can give them one time per day for four days. So you just squeeze it out, it's like salmon flavored, onto their paw, they'll lick it off, and that will help coat the stomach and actually help them um, get rid of their hairball. Of course, that's through um, vomiting. Then you can apply the laxatone two times per week for maintenance and then of course do the regular brushing and that's just to try to help them pass that fur that they're eating when they're grooming themselves so that it doesn't turn into a hairball. So I have a super cool tip for removing cat hair off your furniture. So if you, you know cat hair, we, we have cat hair everywhere. On our clothes, on our furniture, on our beds, comforters, cat trees, in the closet, on the floor, it's everywhere, right? Well, it's hard to get off of fabric. So I'm always looking for like the best way, like lint rollers, 
they're okay. They're not great, but they're good for your clothes, you know, keep it in your purse. You can, you know, run the roller over your clothes and shirt and pants before you get out and go into the store. But if it's in your home, on your furniture, and on your bed, places where your cats lay, the best way to get it off, it's, it's so cool, is get a rubber glove, okay? Like, you know, latex. You put a little bit of water on it, and then you just rub your hand around wearing the glove on the surface of your sofa or your comforter in a circular motion, and your glove needs to be a little bit damp, and all of the hair will stick to the glove, and it kind of makes, you know, a big ball. It's, it works amazing. It gets the hair off and you can literally like clean your whole bed and your sofa and everything. Just walk around wearing this glove and get it a little damp and then just go wipe everything off with your glove and it removes the cat hair. That's a pretty cool trick. And then one last thing we want to mention in our mashup episode is outlet covers in the kitten room. So the little kittens, when they you know, they're leaving their nest and they start going crazy, which is really about five weeks old until they go home. They get very mischievous. They get into everything. They climb, they jump. They, they can get in places that you didn't know that they could get and forget having anything plugged in. I've had cameras in there. I've had Alexa lamps. It doesn't matter. Nothing can be plugged in in the kitten room. And then discovered a solution for this. You can um, plug in, Alexa, stop. I said her name and she heard me. Um, you, you can get an outlet cover and I'll put the link to this resource in the show notes. You can cover up whatever's plugged in and then cover up the cords on the wall with these little things that cover up the cords and so the kittens can't unplug it. So pretty cool to have the outlet covers in your kitten room so that, you know, if you want to put a camera in there or a water fountain that's plugged in. Um, oh, speaking of water fountains or water bowls, um, the kittens love to run and dive like cannonballs into the water bowls. So they have these bowls I've tried every bowl in kitten rooms and these are actually the best that I've found so far. I'll put them in the show notes um, on our website, which is catbreedersensei.com. Just go to podcast and look for this episode. I think we're on episode 23, um, but it's a little travel bowl. It's actually made for a dog and you can put it on the floorboard of the car and it doesn't spill, so they can't knock it over. It doesn't, they can't like jump in it and splash. Well, they still kind of can, but the way that it's designed, it's very minimal splashing. So I love this spill-proof bowl for kittens in the room for their water. Um, check it out in the show notes on the website. All right, that's it for our mashup topics for this episode. Um, thank you again for tuning in to Cat Breeder Sensei Says Podcast. I love your support. I get such good feedback and, you know, we'll continue to do this. Leave me a review, if you will, on the podcast platform of your choice, however you listen to the show. And don't forget to go check out Complete Guide to Breeding Cats, the online course that has a lot of topics that, you know, maybe you didn't know that you didn't know. And you can go advance your knowledge as a pedigree cat breeder and just be the very best that you can be by educating yourself on some on some additional topics. So check it out, catbreedersensei.com. And I will see you guys later. Bye.